So um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, Dr. Haley Nelson has a PhD in Psychological and Brain Sciences from Johns Hopkins University and is an Associate Professor of Psychology at Delaware County Community College with past appointments as faculty at the University of Pennsylvania's Biological Basis of Behavior Program and Research Fellow with the National Institute of Mental Health and National Institute on Drug Abuse. In addition, she has combined her knowledge of the human mind and brain health with her passion for education, teaching and mentoring and founded Be Well Inside and Out with Dr. Haley, where she follows a holistic approach to health and wellness with a focus on prevention. So thank you so much for being here this evening, Dr. Nelson. We really appreciate you uh, speaking with us this evening. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Audrey, and, uh, and to the East Town Library for inviting me through the uh, Speakers Bureau with my college, Delaware County Community College. I'm really excited to be here. So um, as a teacher, of course, I have a PowerPoint presentation prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, if I can find it. Let me just do the... Um, See if this works. There we go. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Right, let me move you guys over to the side. So, all right, how do I minimize? Sorry. <laughs> Can you see all of this that I'm doing? All right, well, I'll just move it up to the top. That should be fine. Okay, so yes, my talk today is on stress in the brain. And ooh, as um, Audrey was saying, I'm Dr. Haley Nelson, Associate Professor of Psychology at Delaware County Community College. Um, a little bit more about me. Um, I, I know Audrey gave a, a brief rundown of my past appointments at University of Pennsylvania and uh, my PhD in, at Johns Hopkins. Um, but I moved to Philadelphia back in 2010. I'm originally from upstate New York, if you can't tell by my nasal accent. Um, but, uh, and uh, when I moved to Philadelphia after graduate school, you can see a picture of my husband and me pre-COVID-19 um, down at, at Love Park. Um, we had our first, our first fur baby, which is uh, Callie. You can see her, she's my golden retriever rescue. And then we had human babies. You can see Charlie and Henry. Um, pictured uh, down below. Charlie is uh, six and Henry will be three in just two weeks. So when we're talking about stress, um, I think we can all, um, we're all in this together as we talked about. And so hopefully I'll be able to, um, you know, personalize it for you and we'll be able to um, have a great conversation about the brain, um, what the stress response is and how we can mitigate it. Um, Audrey also mentioned that I found it be well inside and out with Dr. Haley. Um, that is, a, a, it's really, it's a community that I have. Um, I have a Facebook group and I'm on Instagram. I'll share my, my pages if you're interested in following me where I post, um, you know, health related articles and uh, products recommendations and things like that. I do have a brand partner uh, with Arbonne International um, and I'm really excited about that to be able to partner with them um, to really promote healthy living both inside as well as out. So without further ado, a little outline for my talk. Um, first, I want to talk about the nervous system in general, what it is, why we have it, how it functions, um, and then delve into the neurobiology of the stress response. I am a neurobiologist uh, by, by training. Uh, my PhD uh, is in psychological and brain science. My research was in behavioral neuroscience. Um, so I if I, I get really excited when I talk about the brain. So if I start talking too fast or um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Um, you can put them in the chat section and then Audrey's going to, to ask them at the end. Um, Audrey, if you go through and you, you see them and if somebody says, hey, can you repeat that? Uh, feel free to interrupt me and, and let me know um, if I need to, to say something again. Um, and then once we talk, have a, a basic understanding, you know, I'm, I'm, I could spend an entire semester talking about the, the neurobiology of the stress response. Um, so just in you know, a few minutes talking about that, then I'm going to talk about different ways of using a holistic approach to really mitigate some of the effects of stress and anxiety 
uh, to help manage it. Um, things that we can do every day, things that you know we might want to go see a doctor about. Uh, basically, we're going to run the whole gamut. So um, just a, a, a quick rundown of what we're going to be talking about today. So first, let's talk. I don't know if you can see everything. I wish I could move this over to the side. Um, maybe I'll put it down. The, no, that doesn't help. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So uh, we're talking about the nervous system. Um, there's three basic functions uh, to the nervous system. What it does, what its function really is, is to allow us to interact with the outside world, right? So we receive sensory information through our senses. So through vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, we're able to interact with things outside of our body. Right? And then so we're able to receive it, then make sense of it, otherwise known as processing this information. Um, and then we have some kind of behavioral or emotional response to it. So, you know, let's say there's a bee flying around, right? I can see it, I can hear it. If it lands on my arm, I can feel it. Hopefully it doesn't sting me, right? Um, and definitely don't want to taste it or smell it. Um, but I'm able to say, okay, here's something outside of my body. I, my ner nervous system is able to recognize that it's there, right? Then I have to process it. Now, if I'm a beekeeper and I have a honeybee farm, I'm going to get excited, right? I'm going to say, oh, well, let me move you back to your, your comb and, you know, uh, maybe you can make some more honey for me or, you know, or if I'm a, a researcher investigating the flight patterns of bees, I'm going to get really excited about that. Maybe want to look at it under a microscope, something like that. Or if I'm actually me, <laughs> I'm going to get scared and probably run away from it, right? So my nervous system is able to say, hey, there's a bee, and then I'm able to process it, right? I'm gonna pay attention to it, I'm gonna remember it, um, and then have some kind of behavioral response to it, right? Whether it's harvesting it or running away from it and react to it, okay? So that's the basic function of the nervous system to allow us to do that. Obviously, it's much more complicated than that. But if you think of it as those three main points, um, it kind of helps wrap your head around it, so to speak. All right, so, and also another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about our nervous system, there's, it's really nervous systems, okay? So we have our nervous system and then there's our central nervous system, which is comprised of our brain and spinal cord, right? Um, which we're gonna be talking about today, as well as our peripheral nervous system, which we're also going to be talking about, which is further subdivided into the somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. Think of the autonomic nervous system as your automatic responses, okay? Um, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to tell yourself to blink when you know, something flies at you, or um, you don't have to tell your heart rate to start beating faster when you're scared, right? So then that's separated further into the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system. And we're gonna talk about um, the autonomic nervous system as well as our brain with the central nervous system today. Before we get into that, I just want to give you some numbers, okay? So the average weight of a human brain is three pounds, right, of an adult human brain. Um, but it consumes about 20% of the oxygen used by our body. So let's say you only weighed 100 pounds, right? You would think that if your brain is three pounds, right, that that's 3% of your body weight, that maybe 3% of the oxygen utilization is, is there. But no, in fact, it's about 20% of all the oxygen, which means it's constantly active. It's very active all the time, whether you're sleeping or awake, whether you're exercising, right? You're, that myth about you only use 10% of your brain is just that, it's a myth, right? Um, so um, we're, our brain is a very active uh, organ, okay? Now, what it is comprised of, and this is, again, just our brain. I'm not even talking about the peripheral nervous system or the spinal cord even. Just our brain is part of the central nervous system. There's 100 billion neurons in the brain. Now, neurons are cells, right? But they're specialized cells, which we're going to talk about. But that's what our brain is made up of, for the most part. Our billions and billions, 100 billion of them, right, of these neurons. And you can see an image here under a, a microscope of what neurons and brain tissue would look like under a microscope. Now, if that doesn't kind of blow your mind, that there's 100 billion of these cells packed in together in about three pounds of, of mass, right, each one of those 100 billion neurons has about 10,000 connections with other cells, okay? So, I'm not a mathematician, I don't even know what you would call it, but it's 10 to the 12th <laughs> sites of information transfer. It's a lot. Basically, it's an infinite number of possibilities for how each one of those cells are going to react and respond. Okay, so that's how genetic, identically, uh, identically 
I can't even talk, genetically identical twins can have, can respond differently in different situations, right? They, they might be able to, you know, if, if you have those three processes, it has to sense the information, it has to process it, and then it has to respond. So if we have 100 billion neurons, each with 10,000 connections, the possibilities are endless for how an individual is going to respond. And then when we start throwing, you know, more psychological factors into play with emotion and, you know, mental illness and things like that, that's how we're all so different from one another, right? And we're going to talk about what this information transfer is. Okay? But first, let's look at what a neuron is, okay? So as I said, they're cells. So we have the center of the neuron known as the soma or cell body. That's where your cell nucleus is, your mitochondria, ribosomes, all that fun stuff that you probably learned about in high school biology class. But neurons are specialized cells. They're not just like any other cell. They do exactly what our whole nervous system intends to do. It's going to receive information, process it, and then send information out. So the first step is to receive the information. It does that through areas just outside of the cell body known at, or connected to the cell body known as dendrites. Okay, so it's going to receive information from the dendrites. And then if there's enough information, if the input is great enough, then that neuron is going to actually generate electrical activity and we say that the cell is firing or the neuron is firing. That's actually the technical term <laughs> that we, we call it. It's pretty cool in a, in a lab, you can hook up an amplifier to an actual cell and you can hear it firing and it sounds like popcorn popping. It's a crackling noise. It's, it's pretty amazing that each one of these 100 billion neurons is able to generate electricity. Um, and so it's this electrical signal that can be generated and then that carries down along um, the axon, which is the other part of, of the neuron. And it, that firing is known as an action potential. And it's this action potential that's going down along the axon. And then when it gets to the end of the axon, then it's able to actually communicate with one of those 10,000 connections that it might have. Okay. So those connections, what happens, they're not actually physically connected. There's a space between the two neurons, right? Now keeping in mind, each this is a very simplified uh, version of this um, image. So if we have, one neuron that can have 10,000 connections. We're just looking at one of those potentially 10,000 connections. So we have the action potential, this electrical signal coming down the axon. When it gets to the end of the axon, it triggers a, a chemical release, right? So chemicals known as neurotransmitters, right? So they're transmitting information from one neuron to the other. That's why they're called neurotransmitters. These chemicals are released from this first sending neuron known as the presynaptic neuron, and it's released into the space between the two cells known as a synapse. And then it's able to bind to receptors that are located on that receiving neuron known as the postsynaptic neuron. And it's receiving via the dendrites. Remember the dendrites receive the information and this is what they're receiving. They're receiving this chemical signal, okay? Um, and they bind to these receptors and then the receptors are going to tell that neuron, okay, it, it, we're excited and now you're gonna generate another action potential or maybe the opposite, it's, there's one of two options. It's either going to excite the neuron or it's going to inhibit it. So let's say you have an overactive neuron, right? It's, it's firing too much, then maybe you have a signal like one, a neurotransmitter known as GABA that's going to actually slow it down and it's gonna say stop firing. Um, which we'll talk about different medications that can do that as well. So there's really only one of two options, but you have 10,000 connections that are all sending all of these mixed signals, and then that neuron has to really compute it, and it does math. It's calculating how much of the signal is exciting me and how much of it is inhibiting me, and then if it's strong enough, then it sends an action potential, and the cycle just continues all across however many neurons it needs to get from one part of the brain or part of the body to another. Um, I have this animation that I want to show you. It's from a book publisher that I've used in, in previous courses from Worth um, that does a really nice job um, really animating this process just to give you an idea. It's, it's pretty short. I would like, I'd like to show it to you um, just to see this neurotransmission in action. Oh, sorry. Ah! <laughs> Here we go. Hit the wrong button. I need to hit play. Most neural communication begins with the release of chemical neurotransmitters from the axon terminal. Within the axon terminal, neurotransmitters are usually contained in a membrane called a synaptic vesicle. When an electrical impulse reaches the axon terminal, 
vesicles move to the terminal membrane where they fuse and then spill their neurotransmitter molecules into the extracellular fluid. The extracellular space where neurotransmitters are released is called the synaptic gap or synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic membrane and travel rapidly across the synaptic gap to the postsynaptic membrane where they bind to receptor sites. Individual neurotransmitters bind only to receptor proteins designated for that particular chemical structure. Think of the receptor site as a lock and a specific neurotransmitter type as a key that fits into and opens the lock. When activated by a neurotransmitter, some receptors increase neuron activity, while other receptors decrease neuron activity in the postsynaptic neuron. So hopefully that helped explain it a little further. All right, so at this point, the neurotransmitter has been released, and I keep throwing out these fancy scientific terms. I, I swear scientists purposely try to steer people away from science just by coming up with fancy terminology, but really it's quite, I mean, if you break it down, it's a neurotransmitter. It's transmitting information from one neuron to the other. So when we're talking about these neurotransmitters, they're really just chemicals, any other chemical. Um, they come from foods that we eat, uh, for the most part. These are peptide um, neurotransmitters. And these are, um, you know, some of the more common ones that uh, you've probably heard about. Um, we're definitely going to be talking about serotonin tonight. Um, but there's dopamine and, and endorphins, our natural opiate system, um, glutamate and GABA, norepinephrine, acetylcholine. These are some of the more common ones. Um, and I really like this chart because it shows um, what the function of the different neurotransmitters are and then what can happen if it's out of balance. So um, now just keep in mind that over 100 different neurotransmitters have been identified and research is still constantly identifying more of them. Um, even gases have been identified as being a neurotransmitter like nitric oxide actually has a function as a, um, as a neurotransmitter. Um, so this list is continuing to grow, but these are some of the more common ones that we're talking about when, when we're thinking about psychology. Um, the one I want to focus on tonight is serotonin, right? And you've probably heard about it because it's the neurotransmitter that affects your mood, your sleep and wake cycle. It, it's involved in your hunger signaling. Um, and we know that if we have too little serotonin, it can be linked to depression and anxiety and other types of mood disorders as well. Um, and so a lot of times physicians will prescribe drugs and medications that will raise serotonin levels, right? And when you take one of those medications like uh, Zoloft or Celexa or something like that, it can actually help improve symptoms of depression simply by increasing the amount of serotonin that's available in that synapse to be able to bind to the receptors on neighboring cells. So that's how it works, right? So understanding how the neurotransmitter like serotonin is released, why that's important, and then what can happen if you don't have a proper balance of it. And stress is one of the things that can affect serotonin levels. So it's important that we you know, manage our stress properly. Um, another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, stress is that it's not just your brain. It actually is affecting your whole body, okay? So there's this interplay between the, the nervous system as well as our endocrine system, um, and it's a, a feedback system. It's a feedback loop, so to speak. Um, so the brain is going to send a signal. Like, so if you have a stressor in your life, which we're going to be talking about, um, um, or and it doesn't even have to be the stress signal. This is how we uh, manage our metabolism, our, um, our hormone levels for, you know, uh, monthly cycles for women and, you know, testosterone release and, and all of our hormones, right, are actually primarily controlled by our brain, or at least initially. So our pituitary gland is going to release hormones that goes through the body that are going to be detected by these endocrine glands, like our thyroid or our adrenals or our testes and ovaries. Right? So these chemicals are detected by these glands, and then the glands are going to, in turn, release hormones into general circulation. Um, so this is how our brain is able to actually control all aspects of our body. So not just our brain and nervous system. Now it's interplaying with our hormones and what's going on um, in our body. So it's a really great example of this uh, interplay between both the nervous system and endocrine systems. And then, of course, there's this feedback that whatever hormone is released 
then if there's too much of it, our brain is able to detect that and say, okay, let's shut the system down. It sends a signal to the pituitary to stop secreting that, that chemical that's going to trigger the release of more hormones. So um, that's just in general, the feedback system. We're gonna talk about one in particular in just a few slides. But first, why you all came here today, right? Let's talk about the actual stress system and, and what's happening when, when we encounter stressors. So stress is actually a very um, active term that we use. Um, it's a process of appraising or how we evaluate an event as threatening or challenging, and then how we respond to it, both emotionally and physically um, and physiologically, how we're going to respond to it, okay? So we have events in our life or things that happen to us, those are known as stressors, and if we appraise them or think of them as threatening, um, that's what's gonna really kick in this stress response. And, and threatening, when I say the word threatening, it doesn't, I know it has a negative connotation, but there are plenty of really wonderful things that can happen in your life, right, that might not be threatening, um, like a birth of a child or getting married or something like that. Those are also stressors. Um, but it, it can really put a strain on our body and lead to a lot of strong negative reactions. And what can end up happening, um, you know, this is, our stress response is set up to protect us, right? It's important to be able to recognize a threatening situation so that we can remove ourselves from it, right? If there's something charging towards us and we need to get out of the way, we want our stress system to immediately get activated and protect us, right? So this is essential for our survival. But if we have extreme stress, and extreme stressors or prolonged stress in our life, this is what can cause harm. Right? And so we definitely don't want to have that, but some things are out of our control. And so then we're going to talk about different ways that we can help mitigate some of the negative uh, consequences of having prolonged stress or extreme stress in our life. So I know Audrey set out um, an email um, after she sent out the Zoom link with um, this list of uh, different um, events that can happen in your life. And if you have that handy, go ahead and pull it out. Otherwise, I have it here printed for you. Um, but if you have it handy, go ahead and, and take a look at it. And what I'd like you to do, um, either now or later, um, and if you don't have your email handy, feel free to um, you know, jot your email in the comments or in the, in the chat bar, and I can personally send you an email with this list um, so that you can work on this worksheet yourself. But take some time and kind of look through some of these um, events that can happen. And um, what these authors did, and yes, this is from 1967 that it was published, and there's many um, you know, different versions of this. So this is really kind of the, the fundamental and foundational study that, that did this. So I usually use this because it's still pretty relevant. Um, but what the researchers did is they uh, applied an impact score for certain stressors that can happen in your life, right? So um, you, know, you might have a friend who recently lost their spouse and talk about a stressful situation for that person, right? And that everybody would clearly say, you know, that would be a really stressful time in your life. But then maybe you personally, you don't think you have a lot of stress in your life, but you have 10 parking violations and um, you joined a new gym and, um, you know, you changed your work hours. You're now working four days a week instead of five, or, you know, you, you um, changed your habits. Little minor things like that they can all start adding up, all right? So what you should do is look at these things and say, okay, you know, there's a column on the, the right-hand side next to the impact score on the, the worksheet that um, was sent out to you. Start adding them up, right? So, and, and based on what's happened to you within the past 12 months, so within the past year. Now, if you had um, three parking tickets, for example, in the past year, um, that would be three times 11. Right, so you don't just count it once, you have to count it every time something like that happens. Um, hopefully, you know, you haven't been divorced three times in the past year, I mean, I'm sure that happens, um, but you know, you would want to multiply by how many times any of these events have happened to you personally in the past, um, past 12 months, right? And then add it all up. So get your calculators out um, and start adding it up um, and what you'll find is a score, right? And I have yet to meet anybody who scores under 150, so don't worry <laughs> if you're at 150 or above. Most people that at least I meet um, are over 150. Um, but what it is showing is how many life change units you have in your life and how likely it is that you're going to suffer some kind of illness in the near future. 
Now, illness is very vague, right? So it could be something from, you know, a head cold to cancer, right? So it could run the gamut of what that means um, for illness. But what we're gonna see is adding all these stressors into your life has a negative impact on your immune system. Um, and it, it can really hurt you, you know, with cardiovascular health as well as your um, immune health and make it more likely that you're going to suffer some kind of an illness in the near future. Um, so this is definitely something that, you know, don't be too alarmed. Um, you know, like I said, most people I know are score at 150 or above. Um, and, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind and say, okay, so I have a pretty high score or I'm right around average. Um, what does that mean? What, what, what types of things should I be doing to prevent getting some, or prevent the likelihood that I'm going to get sick in the near future? All right, so again, you can take that sheet, you can work on it on your own time, you can you know, fill it out now while I'm talking whenever it works best for you. Um, but what happens is when you have these stressors, whether they're good or bad, right? Getting married, having a baby, a death of a loved one, getting sick, um, how about a world pandemic happening around you? Um, you know, all of these stressors can start adding up. And what happens is the, there's two different systems that are, it, the whole purpose is to protect us, right? So we have our sympathetic nervous system. If you go back, that's part of our autonomic nervous system. Again, remembering that that's automatic. Um, you might've heard of it as your fight or flight response. Um, and it it's, it's, happens in emergency situations, all right? So I don't know why, but inter psych, introductory to psychology, course textbooks always use the example of a bear coming at you. So it's like, oh, this big grizzly bear is charging towards you. I've never met anybody who's had a grizzly bear <laughs> charge at them. But that's always the example that the textbook authors use. So imagine you there's a, a big grizzly bear running towards you. There's two options for you. You can run away, right? Or you can get really big and, and try to fight, right? So that's your fight or flight response. Um, things that can happen on a daily basis, you're leaning over your sink and your cell phone falls into a, a, a sink full of water, right? You notice instantly, right? You, you start, your heart rate starts like, oh, you know, you might say a curse word and your body automatically kicks in the sympathetic nervous system to prepare you for that brief emergency response, right? Whether it's to save your life from the bear charging towards you or save your cell phone from, you know, a thousand dollars to replace it um, for the new iPhone or something. Um, so those are your emergency responses and it's automatic. The next, uh, the, or the other system that happens is our HPA axis, which stands for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I know it's a mouthful. Um, but what it is, is it's a um, combination of the interplay between our uh, nervous system and our endocrine system. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. But that's where, that's going to be activated for more prolonged uh, stress, stressors. So first, the sympathetic nervous system, remember it's broken down into the, um, our autonomic nervous system is broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Imagine you see a child running towards open water, right? And they can't swim. You're instantly gonna go into protective mode and you're gonna chase after that child and you're gonna try to save their life, right? So you might not realize it, but your pupils are automatically gonna start getting bigger so you can take in more visual information. You're going to start salivating, or, or sorry, your, your salivation is going to start decreasing because you don't really need to have, you know, the enzymes to eat and digest food when you're worried about saving somebody's life. But you are going to start sweating more, right? You're going to start breathing heavier. Your heart rate's going to speed up. Who cares if you need to digest that pizza that you just ate, right? Your digestion system is pretty much going to shut down in that temporary moment because all of your resources are going to start going into mobilizing your energy to save that child, right? And this all happens automatically. In addition, our immune system is going to temporarily slow down. It's gonna be reduced, but we're gonna have an increased release of stress hormones to, to be able to mobilize us to, to get to, the, to that child to save them. You grab that child, right? And the first thing that you're probably gonna do, take that deep breath, right? You save that child's life you'll notice your heart rate slows down, your breathing slows down, you're gonna stop sweating so much, right? Your pupils are gonna start becoming normal. You're, now you're gonna start digesting that pizza that you just ate, right? Your digestion's gonna speed up. Your immune system's gonna start being activated again. Um, so 
think of it, they go hand in hand. When you're in that crisis, your autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic division is going to be activated and it's going to arouse us and mobilize our energy. Then when the crisis is over, our parasympathetic nervous system calms us down. We need this for survival, right? But what happens when you're kind of stuck in that sympathetic activated state, right? This happens all the time during finals week when, you know, with my students, they'll start talking about, oh, they have headaches, they're tired all the time, runny noses, sneezing, they get sick, right? Their immune system is shot. Their digestion system is, is upset, right? They either are going, you know, usually it's they're, you know, just have GI upset. Um, you know, and, and they're going to have this activated sympathetic system, but then as soon as finals are over, everything kind of calms down and they go back to normal, right? Those stress headaches go away, things like that. Um, you know, for the most part, obviously there's some, some students who, who aren't fortunate enough to be able to have that calm state. Um, but that's because, you know, and then they get stuck in that sympathetic aroused state, which we, we want to try to prevent. We want to try to push ourselves into that parasympathetic or calm state as much as possible, right? But be able to activate our sympathetic system when needed. Now, when we have prolonged stressors in our life, this is when our HPA axis becomes the more dominant response, okay? So activating the, the um, HPA axis, again, it stands for the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So we're gonna have our hypothalamus right here in our brain, right? That's going to recognize that there's a stressor in our life, a stressful event. And it's going to send a chemical message, a releasing factor that is detected by our anterior, anterior pituitary gland, which in turn is going to release um, a chemical known as ACTH. Okay? And it's a hormone that goes through our, our bloodstream and it's detected by glands, endocrine glands um, throughout our body. So the one that's going to detect ACTH is it's our adrenal gland. It's located just above our, um, our kidneys. Um, on our, so our adrenal glands um, are going to recognize that ACTH is present, that it was released from the anterior pituitary, and it's going to do its job, which is release cortisol. And you might have heard of cortisol as being the stress hormone. Right? That's what a lot of people call it. There's actually many stress hormones, but cortisol is the main one that everyone talks about. Um, and this is, it, it, we need cortisol, right? Cortisol is good. It's going to mobilize our energy. It's going to help us get through difficult situations. What happens in the negative way, right? When everyone talks about, oh, I'm so stressed out, if you have too much cortisol, right? So our system in an ideal world is set up so that if you have too much cortisol, our hypothalamus, as well as our hippocampus, is going to recognize the cortisol levels in our blood, and it's going to shut down. It's going to stop sending this uh, releasing factor. It's going to shut down the anterior pituitary from doing what it does, which is release the chemical message that tells the adrenal glands to release cortisol. So it's known as this negative feedback that the more of the cortisol that we have, the less that's going to be produced. Um, so, and that's in an ideal world, that's how our, our bodies are set up to function. Um, so, but again, that can get out of whack if we keep having too many stressors and things like that in, in our life. Um, it, when we're talking about our immune system, initially when we have a stressful experience, actually our immune system is activated and we feel great. Some people work really well under pressure, right? Um, and so we can have these increased production of natural killer cells and, and leukocytes and cytokines. They can, you know, combat infections and things like that, but they can also trigger the release of different prostaglandins. Um, now, that, that's a, a, the immediate response, but when you have prolonged stress, that actually weakens the immune system. So, um, you're gonna be more susceptible to illnesses um, and other uh, negative uh, consequences of having a weakened immune system. Um, and also, you'll probably start experiencing symptoms that are similar to clinical depression, right? Feeling tired all the time, not wanting to go out and do things, wanting to stay in bed all day, either overeating or not feeling hungry at all. Um, you know, you'll start seeing symptoms that are very similar to depression. Um, in addition, it's actually harmful to the area of your brain known as your hippocampus. Um, now, the hippocampus is, has many functions. Uh, one main function that it has is our memory system. So this is how we're able to encode and, and consolidate our memories, things that happen to us on a daily basis, 
And research has shown that if we have a lot of toxins that can actually kill the hippocampus or overstimulation of the hippocampus, which can be a result of too much stress, um, that it can actually kill and damage these hippocampal neurons, um, which we don't want. We want to maintain our memories and we want to have a functioning brain um, as fast as we can. Um, in addition, when we have these persistent stressors and negative emotions, right, we talked about how sometimes it can lead to depression-like symptoms, it can lead to unhealthy behaviors. I don't know about you, but when I'm really stressed or feeling down, my new best friends become Ben and Jerry. Right? So Ben and Jerry's, I'm eating a whole pint in one sitting. It's not the healthiest choice, right? You know, a little ice cream here and there, not a big deal, but when you're doing it all the time, that's not really good. Other people might take to using drugs or smoking more, drinking alcohol. Um, other, you know, they might want to eat that a whole pizza instead of just one slice. Um, lack of sleep—that's something that I struggle with. You know, I, I don't sleep very well. I don't go to bed at the right time, and I get up way too early. Um, but those are things that can kind of start manifesting itself. And just think about how you feel after you partake in some of those behaviors. Right? You feel worse. So you're not sleeping well, you wake up not feeling rested, you're gonna start having more negative emotions, more depression, and stressors are gonna keep coming into your life, and the, the cycle continues to perpetuate. Um, so when we have those things, we wanna to try to not do those unhealthy behaviors, which are you know, a totally normal, natural reaction, but we do wanna be mindful of it so that we don't uh, make, the, make the situation worse. Uh, but then we also have, as you mentioned, the release of these stress hormones, like cortisol. And the cortisol, what it can do is activate our autonomic nervous system, which in turn can raise our blood pressure, can give us headaches. Um, it's gonna you know, suppress our immune system. It's known to lead to heart disease. There's so many different consequences. It, it increases belly fat. Um, you know, it, it, it can wreak havoc on all, of, even our, our fertility, right? So it's, it's having too much of these stress hormones in this stress response can, it affects our entire body. So we really wanna to try to mitigate the negative consequences of stress. So um, one way that we can do this, so we have that chart, the life change units, to be able to see how likely it is or the probability of you suffering some kind of illness in the near future. Now, that's a, a good way to identify, oh, I'm at risk or I'm okay. Now, another thing that you might wanna do, and this is something that you should be doing throughout the year, even every week if you have the time or the motivation, but it's a way to really kind of um, sit back and look at your life and say, where am I and where do I want to be? And then be able to identify different areas in your life that you can start improving or working on immediately, right? So that you can try to limit some of that stress. So um, Audrey sent out um, a, a PDF of this uh, wheel of life so that you can have a big picture of it. But if you don't have that, you can literally just draw a circle and have these little pie slices on it um, to be able to, um, you know, I'll walk you through this process to be able to identify areas in your life that are um, really important for you and then areas that you need to improve. So um, some of the categories that are, you know, printed on this sheet use what categories are most important for you, but this is what a lot of people find really important in their life that they really want to try to focus on. Um, but family relationships and, and just parenting in general, uh, personal development, spiritual awareness, fun and enjoyment, um, both intimate as well as social relationships, health and aging, personal finances, as well as your career and profession. All right, so these are just some categories that many people like to kind of focus on that they think are really important to make sure that they're in balance, all right? Now, everyone is going to have their own um, idea of what's important for them. So the first activity for this, what I'd like you to do, you have these uh, different uh, sections, these different categories, and what I want you to do is on a scale of one to 10, circle how important each one of these aspects in your life is, is to you personally. So everyone's gonna be different on this scale, right? Some people might say family and parenting is number one. Other people might say, I don't have any kids. My parents are, are passed away. I don't really have family. It really isn't that important to me, right? Pick what it is that's important to you, right? And then put it on a scale of one to 10 for all of these different categories. Okay. 
And don't stress yourself out trying to overthink it and say, oh, well, it should be at a seven, but I know that it's probably, you know, but I'm probably only at a three. Don't worry. Just put down the first number that comes to mind because what you should be doing is continuing to do this throughout the year and see how it changes, okay? So here's an example of what it might look like for you. Once you have them circled, draw lines so you can kind of create a shape for what your uh, wheel of life looks like for what's important to you, okay? Then the next step, part two, right, is to, using those same categories, now on a scale of one to 10, list how satisfied you are in each one of those domains. Okay, so we circled how important those things are to you. Now I want you to put a square, ranking it from one to 10, how satisfied you are in each one of those areas of your life. And when you do that, you might come up with something that looks similar to this, right? Some things are right in line, right? For this individual, you know, this is, a, I just circled and put squares. This isn't an actual person. Um, but their family and parenting, right on line at nine, right? Super important, and they're really satisfied with how they're doing with that. Um, but then it looks like this person, you know, for fun and enjoyment, they wish that they were having more fun in life, right? They're, they're not very satisfied with how much fun they're having, but it is something that's really important to them. There's that disconnect there, right? Same for their career and profession. Um, now, there might be cases where their social relationships, they're actually more satisfied, right? They're maybe, maybe they're super social, but it's not really that important to them. And that's something to also recognize as well, right? So the next step is kind of debriefing. Think about it. What, what, is, what does your wheel of life look like to you? Notice those gaps, recognize them, don't fault yourself, don't hate yourself about it, you know, if there are any gaps, or if there's, you know, things that you're really in line with, bravo, kudos, feel good, give yourself a pat on the back, that's fantastic, right? You know, as we go through life, our satisfaction and our importance is going to change, so that's why doing this activity periodically is really important, and it's a great activity, you know, with journaling and a way to really get introspective um, in your life to see what areas that maybe need some improvement and maybe, you know, giving yourself some congratulations on doing a really well, a, a good job on those. So what you can do is take these areas in your life that you might want to start improving. Now, I wouldn't go overboard and try to do everything all at once, right? I wouldn't try to be um, more fun and social and, and having enjoyment in life and working on your career at the same time, right? Maybe focus on one and then do the other. Now, for some people, they might say, well, I need to do my um, focus on my career first. And then once I'm satisfied with where I'm at in my career, then I can start focusing on enjoying life more. Other people might say, I need to be happy. I need to focus on enjoyment and finding fulfillment in my life, having some fun. And then if I'm a happier person, naturally my career and my professional life is going to start improving as well, right? So a lot of times these all go hand in hand. That's why they're connected. And it's totally individual. It's what works for you. So, you know, look at those gaps, figure out what's going to work for you. And it's just, it's a great tool and resource to be able to kind of identify um, areas in your life that might need some improvement and other areas that you should be really proud of as well. And again, keep doing these throughout the year to, to see how you've changed, where your, gro your growth is, maybe some things that you really need to start working on more, stuff like that. So once you've identified that you have these stressors, right, what can you do? You have, everybody has stress in their life. And I'm sorry you can't see my headings. <laughs> Um, but we, there's also a PDF of this presentation that I'm happy to share with anybody. So you can jot your um, email in the, in the chat box and um, I'm happy to send out all of the, this information to you directly. Um, but managing um, the stress effects, uh, what can we do, right? First thing that I, I always recommend to people is find a qualified and a quality counselor or psychotherapist. Right? They're going to be able to do activities like that wheel of life, identify areas in, in your life that you need to improve or you know, to focus on and, and help you work through the best ways to tackle it. One way that they can do that is through what's known as stress appraisal, how we're appraising these stressors that happen in our life. Right? We can't avoid stress and stressor. We can't avoid stressors, but we can try to mitigate the effects of stress. Right? And one way that we can do that is how we view these stressors in our life, right? So let's take the current situation. 
right? We have COVID-19 going around. It's, it's worldwide. It's unavoidable. An unavoidable. Now, while that stressor is going to look different for each individual, I mean, if you're a healthcare worker, the stress and, and the, the effect on your life is going to be significantly different than how it is for me, right? I'm working full time and I'm trying to be a kindergarten teacher and a preschool teacher all at the same time. And, you know, also try to be a good daughter and a good friend and a good sister. And, you know, I have all these hats that I have to wear. So maybe I don't look like this individual how I'm handling the stress, but this, <laughs> the person, the, the mom sitting over the sink full of dirty dishes. I mean, I don't know how my kids go through so many dishes in one day. There's constantly dirty dishes in my house. Or this is me, you know, I'm trying to put this presentation together and I've got a three-year-old on my lap and a six-year-old wanting to go out and play basketball. And, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of stress, right? But what you can do, the first step is when you have these stressors coming into your life, is how you view it. That's something that you can control. You can't control the stressors, but you can control how you're going to respond to it. And the first step in how you're going to respond is how you think about it, right? So I could, you know, have all of these things happening in my life and I could say, this is beyond me. I give up. I can't handle this. I'm not supposed to be a professor and a stay-at-home mom and a kindergarten teacher. Like, I didn't sign up for this, right? This is, I, I give up, right? But what good is that going to do, right? How, how, what is my response to that going to look like? I'm going to be fearful. I'm going to be scared. I'm going to be scared for my kids' safety and, and their education. I'm going to be anxious that I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be scared of getting sick, of my loved ones getting sick. I'm, I'm, if I just say, oh, I give up, there's nothing I can do, right? That's going to lead to anxiety, and that's going to lead to a, a negative stress response. However, I, I could say, all right, this is what's thrown at me. I have to apply everything that I know. I can do this. I can be a mom. I can be a daughter. I can be a professor. And I have to figure out maybe that means, you know, scheduling things differently. Maybe that means changing my sleep habits, right? Maybe that means, you know, doing all these other things, but I, I am capable of figuring this out, right? And what my response, how I'm going to feel after that is I'm going to feel aroused. I'm going to feel focused. I'm going to feel motivated and driven to be able to be the best version of me that I can given this horrible situation that we're in, right? The only difference, the stressor is the same for each one of these two situations, right? And still have the, the coronavirus, however it is in your life, right? Whether you're sick or you know somebody who's sick or it's affecting your work or you lost your job or whatever, right? You have that stressor, the stressor itself didn't change. The only thing that changed to make, give it a positive outcome versus a negative outcome is how you thought about it. How did you perceive it, right? And that's something that you can work on with a, a motivational coach, with a psychotherapist, through counseling, a, a lot of different avenues um, that you can do. And the take home point is all of these stressors that we can't control in our life, right? They're all gonna go through with a psychological filter. That's the first thing that's gonna happen because that's what our nervous system does. It takes in all of this outside information and now we're able to process it and then respond to it. So the first step is processing it, right? Going through that psychological filter and that's going to dictate how we respond. Emotionally, physically, and physiologically, how we're gonna respond. So how much stress we experience and how effectively we're gonna to respond to it, the first step is how we think about it, how we appraise it. Um, but for some people, they don't, they don't want to do that, that, that work, right? It's not easy to go see a therapist, right? Maybe, maybe their insurance doesn't cover it. Maybe they don't have the time or the energy, or maybe they need something that is quick, quicker, right? And so a lot of times people will turn to medications and physicians can prescribe things like an SSRI, like Prozac or Zoloft or Lexapro or Celexa. They're all different names for the same thing selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What they do is, long story short, I could teach a whole hour lesson on what um, SSRIs do. Oh, I, apparently Alexa just heard me say something. Now Alexa's talking to me. <laughs> apparently I said, Alexa, what's serotonin? Um, so she's going through Wikipedia right now. Um, but what SSRIs are, um, what they end up doing is increasing the availability of serotonin right? It's not creating more serotonin. It's not releasing more serotonin, but what it's able to do is keep more serotonin in that synapse, in that space between those two neurons, right? So that they can then bind to those postsynaptic receptors and 
do what they're supposed to do, right? To help regulate your mood. Um, other people turn to benzodiazepines. Um, and what these are gonna do is slow down your, your, your nervous system. So if you're very anxious, you have generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, things like that where you're constantly at a heightened state, benzos work very well at slowing down your nervous system. What they do is they send an inhibitory signal Right? Instead of activating and creating more action potentials, it's going to decrease the likelihood that more cells are going to fire. Um, so those are just you know, a couple examples of different medications that are prescribed. Um, and just so you know, antidepressants are the third most prescribed medication in America. So a lot of people are taking them for a lot of different reasons. Um, and they are effective. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're their best choice because you can develop a tolerance to them. Um, and so you're going to have to continually increase your dose. And it's not really fixing the root of the problem, right? It might be making you feel better, but if you're not changing the way that you think about stressors that are going to continue to happen in your life, you're just going to have to continue taking these medications to help regulate, right? Um, other reasons why you might not want to consider taking medications is you might have underlying health conditions that you can't take them. Or maybe the side effects of these medications, because there are plenty of side effects to them, can be more severe than the benefit, right? So you have to do this cost analysis. Is it, is it better to keep taking these medications? Is the symptom relief better or worse than some of the, symptom, um, some of the side effects that you might be experiencing? So other people turn to more holistic approaches, right? And I've listed a few here. We'll talk about them briefly. Um, one of the best things you can do is find social support. Friends, family, um, you know, I'm happy to talk to people as well. Uh, I am not a clinician, I'm not a licensed therapist, um, but I can help refer you to people who I recommend. Um, but also just group, group meetings, right, the, that can help you. Um, I know right now it's challenging. We can't go out with our friends and, you know, go to the mall or go to a restaurant with each other. But what we can do is do things like this. We can do Zoom and we can see each other and smile and have a, a laugh. And, you know, that social support is really, really important. Finding that connection with other people, especially if they're going through a similar process or recently have, they can be that support, that, that guidance for you. Um, extremely important uh, in, in mitigating the stress response. Other things that are very beneficial, and this is something that I'm just now starting to allow myself to do, or at least I've been thinking about <laughs> wanting to do it. I, I've downloaded the Calm app on my phone. Um, I need to start actually using it. Um, but practicing mindfulness meditation and other meditation techniques, um, breathing routine. When you have that really stressful situation in your life, focus on your breathing, focus, recognize what's happening, right? And then bringing it inside and focusing on things that you can control, like your breathing and, and meditating and incorporating that into your life. Research is showing that it's actually mindfulness meditation, for example, is very beneficial. Um, once you've become an expert at it, it, it actually can change the wiring in your brain and allow you to process things differently and more effectively. And things can, you know, when these stressors come into our life, we're able to process them better. Uh, but it takes time. It takes practice. And I think that's why I keep giving up because I'm such a perfectionist and I want to be able to do it right, right away. Um, but I know that I need to just take the time and, and learn this. And it's, it's like a muscle. You have to practice it in order for it to to actually work for you. Um, but other little things, like I have, I don't know if you see behind me my um, diffuser, I have aromatherapy going, that can really help people. Um, different things like that to help you focus on your breathing and how you're feeling um, in, in meditative states. A fantastic um, approach to improving your mood and mitigating the stress response is aerobic exercise. Um, when I talk about aerobic exercise, I'm talking about anything that's gonna utilize more oxygen. Um, so running, biking, swimming, things like that, especially now that the weather's starting to get nicer, this is a fantastic time to really get out and move your body more. Um, increase that breathing rate, increase the oxygen utilization, and, we, and I'll show you this, this one study that showed how effective it actually was at, in, in this particular case, they were looking at depression. So they had a group of women who all had, who scored pretty highly, on a depression scale, um, ranging anywhere from 11 to 13 on this de depression scale. And they separated them into three groups. There was a non-treatment group, so they did nothing. Then they had a relaxation group, and you can see improvement over a 10-week time period. Um, but then look at the green bar. I'm pointing to the screen like you can see what I'm doing. But <laughs> um, here, 
this green bar here, this is the aerobic exercise group, showed a significant, a statistically significant decrease in the depression score, showing that after 10 weeks, just doing exercise, um, significantly improved their mood and actually put them at a much lower uh, scale for a much lower rate for depression. Now, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't want to wait 10 weeks. Well, hate to break it to you, but a lot of those medications that you might be taking or wanting to take can take up to upwards of 10 weeks to really have their full effectiveness. So this is a natural way to be able to counteract some of the negative effects of stress, like anxiety and depression, by naturally doing what some prescription medications do chemically, right? So allowing your body to function optimally by just increasing, um, you know, the oxygen utilization. There's so many benefits to it. Um, and you can see that the relaxation also works well, um, but this study particularly was showing that aerobic exercise over that 10 week period showed uh, the, the greatest effects. Um, now, that's fantastic. Some people, myself included, I'm like, I don't wanna work out, right? That's, that's not my cup of tea, so to speak. Um, and, or other people might have health concerns if they have high blood pressure or history of heart disease or, you know, there's, there's a number of reasons why exercise, you have a bad back, you have, there's something that's preventing you from being able to do aerobic exercise. It's just one tool for the, that could help some people. Um, so I wanna give you some more, um, just in case this isn't right for you. Um, one of the key things that everybody can do is to really focus on your diet and nutrition, right? Um, as I mentioned before, and uh, I'm going to show you a chart in just a couple slides about how our neurotransmitters come from the foods that we eat. So having a proper balance and proper nutrition can actually fuel your body, not only to, you know, give you the energy that you need, but it, it can change your mood and it can change how you look and feel and, and all of these things. Um, this is something that I, I'm actually very passionate about. I discovered this through my own health journey. Um, and it, so now what I do is I have clients that I work with to teach them how to eat clean, right? So to find different foods and, um, you know, different meal plans and things in different supplements that can help support a cleaner, lower toxin level to be able to facilitate lower inflammation and things like that to really help improve all aspects of their life. So, um, and I always forget to mention this, but it's so important, drink water, right? Most of us are dehydrated. So if you have a cup of water or tea next to you, have a sip right now while we're talking. But um, having proper hydration and proper nutrition is going to maintain the salt balance that we need, right? And our, our cells need a proper ion concentration to be able to function properly, right? And not only that, we need those minerals and vitamins and the precursors, like the amino acids, like tryptophan, to be able to create neurotransmitters to be able to function. So this is a, um, a chart, um, I, for the life of me, I cannot find a more updated version of this, um, but it's, it really, it, it does a good job, um, with the exception of saying white bread. I really wouldn't recommend eating white bread to anybody. There are other sources for glutamate, but um, if you look at the neurotransmitter here, the precursor to it, right? So these are, all of these neurotransmitters that are listed are peptide uh, neurotransmitters and they are derived from essential amino acids that we get from our diet. Um, so the precursor to acetylcholine is choline, right? And we can find choline in eggs and dairy and liver and, and things like that. Um, I want to highlight serotonin because that's what we've been talking about in today's lecture. Um, the precursor to serotonin is tryptophan. So you want to try to eat foods that are, have a high level of tryptophan, um, like beets and coconut and eggs and things like that have high levels of tryptophan so that you can make more serotonin yourself naturally. Um, of course, you want to make sure that whatever you're taking, you're able to absorb and, and digest it properly. So you also want to maintain a proper balance of intestinal flora um, to be able to aid in the production of serotonin. Most of the serotonin is actually produced in our gut. And so we want to make sure that the foods that we're eating um, don't facilitate more inflammation. Now, what this is looking at is a study, um, this is a series of studies, it's a, a review of how stress can actually um, increase inflammation and how adding a good probiotic to your daily routine can actually combat a lot of the inflammatory response and thereby increasing the effectiveness of the production of serotonin. So 
I know there's a lot of scientific terms on here. I am not going to try to explain it all. So I put little um, key things on here to, to kind of summarize it for you. So we have stress coming into our life, which in turn is going to decrease the amount of tryptophan, right? That's the take home point. Stress decreases tryptophan, therefore we're not going to have as much serotonin. So it's going to alter our serotonin. And because we have stress coming in, we're also going to activate the stress response. Okay. We talked about increasing and uh, having too much cortisol. Um, what that can lead to is inflammation. Just having inflammation is a stressor in and of itself. So that's going to actually feed back into the stress response. That alone is going to continue the cycle of increasing cortisol level, just having too much inflammation. Um, but also what inflammation does is it can lead to um, liver enzymes to break it down, right? Some of these inflammatory markers need to be broken down. And those liver enzymes can in turn suppress our immune system, which can trigger more stress, right? Which leads to more tryptophan redu reduction, which means less seroton serotonin that you're able to produce. And then and the cycle just continues, right? So we don't want this to happen. How can we eliminate this inflammation? And one way that researchers are... are thoroughly investigating and, and have concluded is that by adding good quality probiotics to your daily um, diet, either through um, the foods that you eat or through supplementation, can significantly decrease the amount of inflammation that you have, which in turn can prevent a lot of these things that are shown here on this, on this chart. So I can actually, by having these probiotics, not only is it gonna help your, your gut health and help you create more serotonin, it can actually prevent the inflammation and lower the stress response and allow you to create more serotonin. Um, now, buyer beware, not all probiotics are treated equally and are as effective. Um, the strain, there's so many different strains out there. The one I use is Bacillus coagulans. That's the strain. Um, and I can, I'm happy to share with you any of the products that I use. Um, if, if you want to, you know, send me an email or anything like that, I'm happy to, to tell you what I use and what I find beneficial. But um, some of them, you know, you're spending money and then most of them die in your gut, you know, the high acidity. So you want to find something that's going to colonize in your gut, withstand the high acidity and high temperatures within your body as well. So um, some strains are better than others. Um, again, I'm happy to, to share with you what I use. Another um, natural remedy, um, this is something that I recently discovered, although it's been around for over 3,000 years. It's the herb um, ashwagandha. Um, it's been used, again, as I said, it's an ancient uh, medicinal herb with a lot of health benefits. If you just Google the term ashwagandha, you're going to see all of the different benefits from it. Um, and one of the things is it's known as an adaptogen. Um, so it's going to actually, and, and clinical results have shown that it enhances your resilience to stress. It can help fight anxiety and depression and boost overall brain functioning. Um, now, I, you know, as a researcher, I was always taught like more Western medicine. So that's why this is relatively new for me, just through my own health journey, discovering all of these new alternative um, alternatives. Now, they are supplements and they are not evaluated by the FDA. So please, 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 before you start just going out and buying all these products, talk to your physician, make sure that it's okay for you, that it's not going to cause any other kinds of um, side effects. So it's not going to be, you know, counteract with some other medications that you're taking. Um, but clinical results do show that it, it's known to reduce cortisol levels and thereby anxiety as well as inflammation. Um, so this is something that um, I've started taking and, and I've seen a benefit me personally. But again, consult with a physician before you start taking any of these kind of supplements. Um, and that's ashwagandha. The next supplement, you can't see it, but it's called phosphatidylserine. Um, phosphatidylserine is located in every single one of our cells. It helps form the cell membrane. And, um, but you can actually take it as a supplement as well. And um, clinical results show that it can help support um, cortisol levels. It's um, one of the main benefits of supplementing with phosphatidylserine is to boost your memory. So it's actually given a lot to patients with Alzheimer's disease and early onset dementia, um, as well as Parkinson's disease, other neurodevelopmental um, or neurodegenerative diseases um, to really help protect the cells, protect your neurons. Um, facilitate uh, proper brain functioning. Um, and it's also, they're looking more into it as a natural treatment for ADHD as well. Um, so it is, it's, again, it's found naturally in our body, but taking it as a supplement, again, not evaluated by the FDA. Um, so I'm not trying to say it's going to cure anything, but um, it is something possibly to, to look into. 
again, I'm happy to share you the different products that I use um, that I've you know, researched and find most effective um, for me that I trust. All right, lastly, you wanna to try to reduce toxins in your life, right? So everyone's focused on you know, how you're mentally thinking about things, what you're eating, right? That's what we've been talking about so far. But a lot of people forget the fact that our skin is our largest organ and whatever we put on our skin is going to get into our bloodstream and can lead to more inflammation. So there's a lot of things that, um, you know, in our personal care products, as well as um, things that we inhale, right? Our lungs also have a very large surface area. So we wanna to try to reduce toxins. Um, but uh, certain toxins that can find in your body lotions and soaps and shampoos and sunscreens, like parabens, phthalates, mineral oils, things like that, um, a lot of them are known to be endocrine disruptors. So they're actually affecting your hormone levels. Um, a lot of them are carcinogens, lead to cancer, um, and take on point is they can you know, facilitate and increase the amount of inflammation that you have. So by limiting your exposure to some of these toxins in your life, it can actually help reduce the inflammation and lead to you know, healthy inside and out, which is you know, <laughs> why I started my, my, um, my, my business with promoting healthy living inside and out to try to reduce inflammation and, and help people live happier, healthier lives. Um, again, I, I work with clients all the time to help them identify healthier alternatives, both for their nutrition as well as some of their um, personal care products as well, um, to, to just help them feel and look better. And last but not least, as it's you know wrapping up, I'm sorry I, I talked too long. Um, it's after eight o'clock, so the most important thing, and not the most important, but one of the more important things is to sleep. Get restful sleep. Um, very, very important. Uh, you know that when you don't get enough sleep, you're grouchy, you're not feeling well, you're not thinking well, clearly. Um, and so you want to try to get as much quality sleep as you can. So I want to thank you uh, for coming and taking the time this evening to listen to me. I want to thank the Easttown Library for inviting me and, of course, Delaware County Community College for my job, <laughs> um, but then also for allowing me to be um, a speaker on our Speakers Bureau. Um, to be able to come out and, and do events like this uh, through the library. Um, and I wanted to give my uh, contact information. Um, here's my personal email, feel free to email me. You can also follow me on Facebook or Instagram if you're um, into those um, things. <laughs> um, and also I wanted to put the courses that I teach at Delaware County Community College. Um, we're going to be, uh, I'll be teaching all online in the fall um, due to uh, COVID-19. So and my, our courses are open to anybody. So um, feel free to enroll in one of my classes if you'd like to learn more. Um, I teach uh, intro psych, so general psychology and addictions course, as well as an introduction to biological psychology. So um, without further ado, I think that wraps it all up, but um, I definitely want to open it up for questions if anybody has anything. If you don't, um, you can leave, I won't be offended. <laughs> um, but um, also if you want, you can leave your email address in the chat and I can send you um, any information that uh, you might want um, and, uh, you know, anything like that. So thank you again so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Nelson. I, we really appreciate it. If anyone wants to put any questions in the chat or say raise your hand, um, you're definitely welcome to ask questions now. Um, I did put a link in the chat for everyone um, that is the link to this whole um, PowerPoint presentation. So if you want to click on that link, you can open it up and you could bookmark it or send it to email uh, to friends. Uh, so you're welcome to do that um, or respond to any of the emails that I sent with the Zoom invitation um, and the handouts. And I'd be happy to pass any questions you have on uh, to Dr. Nelson as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Oh, good. I have a student on here. I'm taking, she's taking my class this summer. That's fun. <laughs> and I see one of my colleagues. Yes, Jilly, you can message me later. <laughs> so, but I, I put my email on here. If anybody has any questions, um, you can email me separately as well. Um, as I said, you can follow me on Facebook or anything like that. Um, yeah. Or email Audrey and, um, sorry, Audrey, not Aubrey, but um, Audrey and, and she can forward the messages on to me as well. But I am available now if anybody has any questions. Oh, well, so um, if you wanted to also put the, uh, the name of that probiotic in the comments. 
Yeah, so it's really uh, interesting and, and hard to spell. <laughs> yeah, so well, I know. And so it's the strain that I, I mentioned, it's bacillus coagulans. Again, it's definitely hard to spell, but I'll, um, the product I use is the Digestion Plus, and that's through Arbon, um, which is the, uh, my, um, my brand partner that I use. So if that's something that you're interested in, I can give you a discount. So <laughs> if you reach out to me, I can um, send you a link to be able to, to, to try it out. I can send you some samples and things like that. But um, yeah, the probiotic that I use is Digestion Plus. It's fantastic. I love it. It has prebiotics, probiotics, as well as digestive enzymes to, to help support gut health. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, I saw a hand up. Is it Robin? Yeah. Um, did you want to ask a question? I did have a question. Um, I was wondering about long-term stress. I think that uh, the pandemic may be creating stressors that we're not even aware of. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think... Every so often I feel them, you know, I go through life day to day and everything's fine and then it just kind of hits you. Do you have any advice or thoughts about combating um, long-term stress either for ourselves or our kids? Um, I, I, mean, I, have, I have adult kids, but any kids. Yeah, no, I mean, we're all experiencing it. There are days where I just, you know, I have to break down and cry. And, you know, and then there's other days where I'm like, I'm a rock star, I'm Wonder Woman, I can handle it all. Um, but I think we're all everybody around the world is, is experiencing some kind of stress right now. Um, sleep is very, very important. Um, and drinking and hydrating, drinking lots of water. Um, those are the two things, the easiest ways to remedy it. But some of those other, um, you know, supplements, changing your diet, really focusing on yourself, doing some of the activities that we talked about today. Um, I know Audrey said that she's going to be, um, this meeting is recorded, so you can feel free to share this recording. Um, to your kids and, and maybe they'd find something um, beneficial that they'd like to, you know, either chat with me about, um, you know, any of those holistic approaches, um, you know, those are all things that we can do on a daily basis, really kind of thinking about, okay, how can I handle everything that's going on in my life? How am I, can I appraise this stressor? How am I thinking about it, right? Am I going to throw my hands up and look at it as a threat or am I going to look at it as a challenge and really put my energy and, and, and focus into getting through this. I mean, we're all, it, it's hard. We're, this is hard for everybody. So they are not alone. You are not alone. Um, there's, you know, like I said, in the video, in this lecture, I, I mentioned a few things, but what works for one person might not work for somebody else. So right? it's so, it sort of sounds to me like you're um, suggesting that uh, almost take a prophylactic approach to preventing oh. Absolutely. Stress. Yes. You may not really know you're feeling it right now, but take that prophylactic approach. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the hardest things, you know, people wait until they're sick to go get treated. Whereas if they took the prevention aspect and really focused on being healthy and having a healthy immune system, a healthy gut, a healthy brain, you know, nervous system, Beforehand, mm -hmm. you'll be able to handle the stressors when they come because we're all going to get these stressors. We're all going to have our ups and downs. And, you know, looking at prevention is a lot less costly um, financially, emotionally, physically than trying to treat a disease or a disorder that, that you could get. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And limiting blue light it, right before bed, especially turning off your cell phone and your TV, it it's messes with your circadian rhythms and your sleep cycle. So, you know, there can be somebody who's sleeping eight hours a day and, but they're, it's not, they're not getting restful sleep because their, their circadian rhythms are thrown off by, mm -hmm. by that blue light. Okay, There's little things like that. Any other, any other questions? Oh, I see one popped up here. It says, how can we teach others about maintaining this healthy brain balance? Uh, I'm always annoying family about how the brain needs rest and exercise too. So any good tips about how to teach uh, friends or family? Be a living example, right? So practice what you preach. Um, show, I mean, that's, that's you know, it, it's a big struggle. As, we were, as Robin was mentioning, it's like a prophylactic approach, focusing on prevention. People don't want to listen to you until there's something wrong, and then they come try to get advice from you. Um, so it, it's very important to have this healthy brain balance. There's a lot of um, 
good videos out there, a lot of information. Um, as a, as a scientist, I love seeing clinical studies and, you know, I, I'm an, a science nerd, so I like seeing those kinds of reports. Other people like the feel good emotional stories, right? So kind of have to cater to your family and friends about, you know, what's going to work best for them. Um, but showing them examples, there's great documentaries out there. Um, and, you know, again, living by example. So if you're trying to say, you know, it's so important to exercise and so important to eat well, and then you're sitting there eating a chocolate cake and drinking wine and not exercising, you know, they're going to look at you. It's like, well, if it's so important, why aren't you doing it? Um, and it takes time. Sometimes, you know, people don't listen until it's too late, right? And then they have to try to fix the problem instead of prevent it. Um, it's definitely a, a hard balance, um, but there's lots of naturopathic physicians out there or homeopathic physicians that that's their whole bread and butter. That's what they do is try to teach prevention. So um, Jenny, you can feel free to email me. I can send you a bunch of links and resources to things that I, you know, I enjoy if, you know, if you like my teaching style um, or from like a scientific perspective um, and, and maybe that can help with your family as well. Great. Thanks for the question, Jenny. Okay, well, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email either of us and we'd be happy to, to um, respond or Dr. Nelson be happy to respond. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. This is, this is great. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Hope to do it again soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to have you back.